tonight, if you will, if you'll turn with me to Leviticus chapter 19, your favorite book of the Bible. Is this the love chapter? It is, isn't it? Yes, it is the love chapter of the Bible. Leviticus 19. You know, we've been preaching through 1 Samuel, and I had originally intended to preach again from that this week, but the Lord laid upon my heart to do something I actually have never done before, which is to go back and find a sermon that I have preached a few years ago and to revisit that, to refresh in that, and to bring that back to you. You know, the Lord has blessed us greatly as a church, right? In a time when the birth rates of our nation are all-time all, uh, all low, and they are continuing to fall, and when those same people vote for the ability to murder their unborn children, uh, this church stands a refreshing oasis, Right? The Lord has blessed us with many little souls. And actually, now we're entering into a stage of life in this church I think is pretty cool. Uh, I may have told some of you this. So I, up until now, in, in our church's history, we've been mostly people in our 30s and 40s and up and above a little bit more. And uh, why am I looking over? I'm just looking out the window. And lots of little kids right? But now we have some of those little ones that have grown up and they're getting married and now they're having children. And so we're going to spread out. We're going to have grandpas. We have a grandpa. We're going to have another grandpa. We're having grandchildren and just different generations. So it is, this is an exciting time, a wonderful time. And it's wonderful to be in a church filled with so many little children. But due to our location, the size of the building, other issues also comes with growing pains, right? And uh, I want you to know these are actually good problems to have. Most of our conflict in this church is really over what to do with our kids. And what a great, what a great problem to have. Like if I go visit my dad's church, you know what most of the conflict is? How to bury the old people how to deal with old people that are, don't have any kids. And so it's a truly a blessing to have a church full of mothers and fathers. And of course, that brings a lot of challenges. And many of you mothers are right in the thick of it. And so what I want to do today is to encourage you in your work. And I want you to have faith in your work and to not give up or be discouraged. And so this sermon is actually primarily de directed at you women, especially and in particular women with lots of little children, young children. So listen up, fathers, if your children get fussy, it is your job today to take them out so that your wife can hear this sermon, okay? So you're in charge today, and somebody help my wife please too, since I can't necessarily take them out. Now, if you are a guest, maybe you're a young man, you're not married, uh, you had your children all grown, this, there are still principles for you. In fact, this would apply, this message to the tightest two women of our church as they deal with the other women. It would apply to the elders, it would apply to all of us, that we have to have faith for the fruit. And so, we're going to be looking at two passages in particular, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 23 through 25. And then Psalm chapter 1, which we sang, uh, verse 3. So let's go ahead and read uh, the Word of God. So uh, Leviticus 19, 23 through 25. This is the Word of the Lord. It is eternally true and applicable for all of life. When you enter the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, then you should count their fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you, it shall not be eaten. But in the fourth year all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. In the fifth year you are to eat of its fruit, that its yield may increase for you. I am the Lord your God. And then Psalm chapter 1 verse 3 says, He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit when? in its season. 
This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray that God will bless the preaching of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your tender care. Even though we were your enemies, you gave of yourself. You gave Christ to die. And in his death, he gave life to us. Teach us to die to ourselves so that we may bear much fruit. Forgive us for grumbling, complaining, for bitterness, for shortness of temper towards others that are at different stages of their growth. Forgive us for our harshness towards our children and for forgetting that there is a goal. Forgive us for thinking of ourselves instead of your holy will. I pray that you would give, in particular, the women of this church attentive ears, soft hearts, and faith. Help me to preach truth that they need to hear. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In early spring, a gardener begins the backbreaking work of sowing and plow, actually of plowing the garden and then sowing the garden. First, she tills the hard soil. She gets blisters on her hands. She prepares the ground to receive the seed, places the seed in the ground, covers it over with dirt, waters it, and then waits. But the waiting is not inactive. It is active because day by day she waters, she pulls weeds, she checks for insects and other pests. She covers the plants to shield them against the late frost, prays that they survive. She works in the drought, she works in the rain, she works in the scorching heat. And in the midst of all this labor, she does not see much yield on her investment. As she checks the plants each day, they actually don't seem to have grown any from the previous day. She can be tempted at this time to give up because she knows that all the neighbors go to the grocery store and they get similar vegetables. They save themselves much time and inconvenience. Maybe her husband is actually not really interested in tending the garden or maybe he's too busy to help. So she sacrifices much of her time to help take care of the, car care of the garden and she's tempted to resent the workload and the seeming lack of progress. And then summer happens and there's a long wait. And eventually though, after what seems like forever, the plant starts to blossom and it begins to produce fruit. And at first it's not much, but it is sweet. And as late summer, summer and early fall approach, that tender shoot she cared for as a little seedling begins to produce an abundance of vegetables. So fresh and delightful, actually nothing at the grocery store that her friends went and bought can even compare. And the meals that she is going to prepare with these fruits are delightful. Everyone's praising her cooking. She has enough harvest to share with others. And when winter rolls around, she grabs a jar of her canned vegetables that she grew and she serves them to her family. And she takes a bite and she considers how thankful she is. She did not give up in the middle of the summer before the harvest. And the cold weather that keeps her inside causes her to look back with great fondness on those hot summer days. On her hands and knees, she carefully weeded around that tiny shoot of a plant that never seemed like it would grow. And in the wintertime, when it's cold, you can't go outside. There's no life around. She wonders, how could she have ever complained about the time out in the sun doing the work of a gardener? Mothers, between planting and harvesting, you have to wait. There's always time between planting and and harvesting. You will work and you will not see immediate fruit. Now you may become so focused on your immediate circumstances that you don't see actually where you have been or where you're going. But my message to you today is there is a time between planting and harvesting and you have to have faith for the long haul. 
Mothers of small children are often tempted to despise the daily chores, the constant discipline, the fussiness, the sleepless nights. You're tempted to resent your husband because he gets to go off to work and leaves you with the children all day. You're tempted to bitterness towards your children because, well, you just cleaned up that glass of milk that they spilt, and now they spilt a glass of water on their clothes. You're tempted to build bitterness because your children take up so much of your time and they seemingly give you so little in return. You're tempted to resent your church because Sunday feels like a bear wrestling match just to keep your kids under control. You hate that your husband has to discipline them or that he's a doofus and doesn't seem to notice their misbehavior that they cry during the sermon, and everyone gets to look at you, and you get to feel guilty about it all. Maybe it feels like most Sundays you're only getting bits and pieces of the sermon. Sometimes you miss it entirely. And then are your kids even getting anything out of church, right? And that simple thought brings on a whirlwind of excuses and complaints. What's the point of even going to church when you're just a distraction? Maybe it would be better just to stay at home. Maybe you need to find a church where kids are not expected to be in the sanctuary during the sermon. And if that's not enough, then you're tempted to despise small groups because it's more of the same to you, feeling like you're trying to corral kids in a house that's not yours. Or if it is your house, worrying about your kids and now everybody else's kids making a mess and breaking stuff. And not without good reason for that. You're also tempted to hate homeschooling. Or if you don't homeschool, to hate and despise helping your children with their homework. Because the kids grumble, they complain. You have to get them to fight to get them to do what they're supposed to do. There's things you would rather be doing, things actually you would rather be doing, and things that you know that need to get done, and when you're going to find time for that. And you wonder if they'll ever just learn the lesson. Maybe if you just let them go their own way and get bad grades, they'll learn their own lesson. And so you feel inadequate for all this responsibility you've been given. Mothers, there is a delay between planting and harvest. When you're in the trenches, you can't quite see what's going on outside them. Right? In the midst of the unrelenting efforts of motherhood, you're actually partially blind to the growth that's going around you. Because you're so close to the plants. Consider, for example, if you had a friend that you haven't seen in a while, and you see them and they've lost weight, and you notice it right away. Man, there's something different about this person. They've lost weight. Your friend, though, and often those closest to him, haven't even noticed the white weight loss because they see him every day. And, his, and to him, maybe his efforts may seem fruitless until an outside source tells him, Mothers, it's so easy to be so in a situation that you don't see the little growth that happens day by day. Some of you are so entrenched in daily battles with your children, you don't see the fruit that's being produced in their lives, even among all those battles. And even if you do see the progress, sometimes that progress gets back into regress, right? You see struggles that seem to overshadow the good, and it makes you cynical, and so the closeness to the situation can also cause blind spots regarding problems that need to be addressed. So not only do you not see the fruit and the progress, you sometimes, because you're so in the thick of it and you're doing hard things, don't see the actual problems that need to be addressed. And so mothers, you can be so nearsighted, so focused on the day-to-day -day work, you lose track of the big picture. You lose sight of the end of goal. You're so busy pulling weeds, dealing with the hot sun, fighting off insects, cleaning up spills, changing dirty diapers, trying to talk down tantrums, helping kids with homework, and trying to stop fights between siblings, that you actually forget that there is a harvest to be gained. You have a hard time seeing that all this headache and frustration has a purpose. And you often forget that there's a goal beyond getting food on the table and keeping people and clothes clean. Right, the healthy meal, the fresh clothes, the clean kids, there are a means to an end, not the ends 
in themselves. Those works pave the road to where you're going. And so, mothers, don't forget, you're actually going somewhere. Much of your frustration, your bitterness, your tiredness, your I'm done, I'm ready to quit, is because you forget there's an end goal. And often you cannot see the fruit that is already growing before your eyes. And so, moms, this is why you need your husband. Right? He's often able to see the bigger picture and can help you remember your goal. Like, what's the purpose in all this? Why are the kids in worship with us? Why do we do small groups? Why are we educating our children? Why are we disciplining them? Why do we do these things? Answer those questions. What does the fruit look like? And perhaps your husband will not have all the answers for those questions. Maybe he doesn't even know what fruit looks like himself. Now, men, your job is to know what fruit looks like. And your job is to have a plan and to know where you're going. If you don't have a plan and you don't know where you're going, Mark, what's our saying? You can't follow a parked car. You can't follow a parked car. And so, men and women, ask God to give you both a vision for the big picture. You need to know where you're going. You need to have before you this picture of great big red tomatoes, fresh green beans, crisp green peppers, and that refreshing watermelon that comes at the end of summer. Leviticus reminds us this, that there is a season for planting seeds and you will not harvest. And then there's a season for reaping fruit in which you get to enjoy it. Many of you today, most of you today are in the planting and working the garden season. And this season of life is fearful because you don't know for certain what the fruit will look like. Now, when you plant a garden, you pretty much know what the fruit will look like. You know what you're planting. Right, you go out and you put corn in the ground, and you come out the next, and at the end of harvest, and there's apples. Well, something has gone terribly wrong. But with this kind of work, You're not guaranteed, at least, a good harvest, at least not by your own standards. For this reason, you have to make sure you work hard with faith to have the best chance to produce, and that's stressful. But parents' fruitfulness really is dependent upon God, right? Even in your garden. Those tomatoes you plant aren't guaranteed to come up. Those green beans you plant are not guaranteed to come up. <clears throat> this year, we planted a bunch of green beans, and did we get any green beans? Maybe enough for one mill. Most of them didn't even come up. God gives the rain and the sunshine. Now, if you're driving yourself crazy, nitpicking everything you do, your focus is not on the fruit you're trying to cultivate, but rather on yourself. You're worried about what you do for the fruit producing process. And what ends up happening is you begin to compare yourself to other gardeners. And you're constantly checking out all the latest and greatest gardening techniques. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to be a good gardener, but when you forget that without the rain and the sunshine, your garden will not grow, you begin to stress yourself out with worry and bitterness. And so I know you're in a time when it feels like everything depends on you and your work, but really, it all depends on Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Much of the reason for your discontentment, your discouragement, your anxiety, is you've actually taken your eyes off Jesus and you've kept them on yourself. This is why you fall apart whenever you get criticized. Because you're doing everything you know how to possibly do, and any criticism now is an attack on you. I can't just do anymore, right? But if your eyes are on Jesus, then you're trusting Him. And you know that, well, criticism is not really anything that hurt you. Actually, Tim Bailey says that criticism is the manure in which Christians grow. It stinks, but it causes us to grow. 
So part of the problem is you've either decided it's all on you to grow the plants and therefore you're disheartened every time struggles hit because you think the hard winds, the scorching suns, the weeds and the bugs are all a reflection on you. Or you've decided to be so focused on your discomfort, your blisters, your tiredness, your sore back that you grow bitter at the work before you. Right? You take every occurrence of a brother hitting a brother as a sign that you are a complete failure as a mother. Every time your child acts up in church, you take it as evidence that you're just not cut out for this and perhaps you ought to stay at home. You know, I, I like watching uh, videos on homesteading stuff. There's this guy named Justin Rhodes. Anybody ever heard of him? Maybe some of you have, right? He's got this huge homestead and he's got these videos that are well done. And it just looks so good, right? And so I look at that, and then I look at my garden. I've grown a garden for like two years. And then I look at the fleurs, and they've grown a garden. How long have you been growing a garden? A long time, they've, since they were born probably. And last year, I compared my garden to theirs. And you know what happened? I got very jealous. When my carrots did not come in, I was discouraged. But here's the question, why should I compare my garden to the professional homesteading videographer who makes everything looks perfect, or to our dear brothers the and sisters, the Fleurs, who have worked real hard for years to build up that experience? I can learn from them both, but I'm not where they are at yet. I should not give up or grow to despise them, especially if he were to come and try to help me with my garden. What an idiot would I be if he came to me with encouragement and strength, maybe even correction. You're not growing that right. Well, who are you to tell me I'm not growing that right? I've, I've done all the research. I've, I, it must grow this way. This is the only way it can grow. Are you sure? This is how we grow it. You're not doing it right. Feeling the weight of your failures, you begin to compare yourself to others. Why, why are we not in the same place as those other homeschoolers? Why is it so-and-so kids cheerfully clean up after supper and your kids won't even pick up their shoes off the floor? Well, it could be that you need to teach them and instruct them, but even worse, mothers, you compare yourself to women you don't even know via the internet, having no idea what lies those women are probably telling on the internet about how well they are doing. I don't want to tell you the name, because then you'll focus on that, but I know a, a man, this is a Manosphere blog guy that like everybody looks to, and I got to visit his house, and what I saw in his house did not match what I saw on the internet. Just so you know, what you see in pictures and video can be carefully choreographed. And so if you're tempted to see yourself as a failure when your situation does not match others, you should probably just stop listening to podcasts and blogs. They're not, for many thousands of years, nobody ever knew what a podcast was. What do you call a group of white men when they get together? A podcast. Okay. Oftentimes, when men get together, we size each other up. We want to be seen as respectable in each other's eyes. And you women rightfully think that's pretty silly. But if it's silly for us men, how much more for women to get together in a Bible study and to compare themselves to each other? you got to stop it. You're not in a competition with the Sabies, the Coxes, or anyone else. You're not in a competition with anyone at your church or any of those very humble people on the internet. Remember, you must remember your identity is actually in Christ, and it is He you ought to aim to please. On the other hand, be willing to learn from those who came before you. Right? Don't use the excuse that since other people don't know your circumstances, they should just stay quiet and not act like know-it-alls. Or maybe they've all 
got their kids grown, and you think, well, yeah, but they don't have as many as I did. They don't know what it's like to have little children. I have really, it's, it's really funny when people that have children are told by others that they don't know what it's like to have little children. Do you think their children came out full grown? You need to be able to learn from those more experienced than you without feeling resentment, jealousy, discouragement. Titus 2 says that older women are to teach the younger to love their husbands, to love their children, to be, uh, what else? Keepers at home, what else? Come on, help me out. There's other stuff. Not addicted to much wine, okay. That's what older women are not supposed to be. You know why older women are often driven to drink? It's because the younger women don't listen to them. Okay, so don't drive our older women to drink. Now, um, also to be temperate, to be uh, uh, modest. I mean, just to be women. Not the gossips, right? Now, if they need to be teach, what does that tell you younger women that you need to be? Teachable. Now, there's a lot that, that needs, in, in this whole thing, as I talk to mothers, the tightest two women in this church also have to hear this too, right? You, you've got to be patient and wait for the harvest. So we all have work to do. Listen, when you experience droughts and hell storms in life, it's not always a sign that you're a bad gardener. It could be. But mothers, you must constantly remind yourselves that your value is not found anywhere else but in Christ. And it is He who must work in and through you to make you and your home fruitful. Christ. There's no magic button. There's no, if we do... X, Y, and Z, our children will turn out like this. I've known people that have done X, Y, Z, and their children did not turn out like this. Now, to be sure, this does not mean that you're to be lazy in your work. There is not an excuse to give up striving for improvement. And this also does not mean that the state of your home is never a reflection on you. The life of a Christian mother is a life of repentance. Repentance. Did you know that? Why is the life of a Christian mother the life of a repentance? Because the life of a Christian is the life of a repentance. Every one of us. That's like Martin Luther said. It's, one of the, it's the very first thing he put on the wall or on the door of the church. And so we all need to be able to handle correction, encouragement, even rebuke without falling apart and giving up. Even if you feel like you're doing your very best, you're barely hanging on, and then a pastor or an elder or an older woman in the faith comes and suggests corrections. Don't lose heart. Those corrections are for your good, not to tear you down further, but rather to take you by the hand, pull you up when you're barely hanging on, and then build you up once you're on your feet. You can't think, oh, well, I'm a failure. I'll never get this. That's a way of making excuses and agreeing with the devil, the accuser of the brethren. Forget yourself. Forget yourself. Cling to Jesus by faith. Remind yourself that it's Jesus who will make you fruitful. He will help you to raise children who continue in the faith, and he will bring you through the trials of motherhood. Only then will you be free to garden through the storms of life. If you cling to Jesus, then actually you can hear correction without hearing that you're a total failure because Jesus is your identity. You can repent because Jesus is your identity. You can help others because Jesus is your identity. And you can work on being better. 2 Corinthians 7.10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance, Listen to this, without regret. Repentance without regret. Doesn't mean you don't regret your best actions. It means not regretting the repentance. Leading to salvation. That's what it leads to. But the sorrow of the world produces death. 
And I know it's hard to accept correction. It's hard to accept this sermon. It's hard, right? If somebody criticizes one of my sermons, let me tell you, I'm tempted to get defensive. But leaning on Jesus, trusting in his call, right, it's the only way we can get through this. Mothers, wives, hold your identity in Christ. Trust that in him you are righteous. Trust that you've been called to him, by him to your station in life. He's called you. He will see you through. And since that is true, you also know he gave you your husband. So you don't have to bristle if your husband tries to lead you. Let me tell you, husbands are often afraid of little things. Some men could not be afraid of anything. But there's one thing that most men are very afraid of. It's their wives. Uh, Even the the most bold man is usually afraid of his wife. Why? Because their wives often refuse to receive correction. When you correct, they become angry, become accusatory, or they just crumble in tears. And the worst thing that uh, a man could ever see is tears on his wife's face. Right? Right? Does anybody like that? I don't like it. Usually the correction husbands have to offer will help their wives. But since their wives won't hear it, husbands often give up trying. And so if your husband doesn't lead your house, well, you need to ask yourself, have I stopped him from leading? Have I been the reason he doesn't lead? With this perspective in mind, respect your husband. Know that when he approaches you to help you as a mother and offer correction, he's often doing it while fighting fear himself. Also know that your pastor and your elders are keenly aware of our own fears. And we too, when we come to you, are coming in faith, afraid. Right? It's easy to be afraid of you. Men... This thing always is an encouragement to you. It's from John Wayne 316, okay? It's in the Bible, John Wayne 316. Courage is being scared to death, but getting up on your saddle and riding anyways. All right, so when you're afraid of your wife, you just get up on that horse and you ride anyways. Fear is not an excuse. Now, women, you don't always have to agree with your husbands. If you're clinging to Christ, though, you can grow and you can submit So what I'm saying is, be settled in your conviction that Jesus is Lord, that God is your Father and you are His daughter, and nothing will change that. Nothing will change that if you are His daughter. When you think of that, then your your husband, the other women of the church, even your children are, are used by God for your benefit. Good gardeners take advice from more experienced gardeners, and you should be willing to. Furthermore, as you're gardening, do not be so focused on your own discomfort, your blisters, your tiredness, your sore back, that you grow more bitter with every discomfort and difficulty and wonder, what's in this for you? Don't think so much about you that you despise your labor. Jesus called you to this difficult work. He knows that you're going to have sleepless nights. He knows that sometimes kids throw up on you, that you have little hands pulling at your hair and people tugging at you. He knows you will hear crying so much that you will hear crying when no one is crying. You ever heard that? Yes. He knows your children will not always obey right away, all the way with a cheerful attitude. He knows you will have changed a diaper and then you went to sit down and have to change another diaper right before you get to eat. He knows you'll miss sermons. He knows you will miss part of the fellowship. He knows your labor and he called you to it. And quite frankly, if you want to compare suffering stories, Jesus has you beat. He was a man acquainted with sorrows. He was scourged spit on, mocked, crucified by his own creation. Those who should have been his children killed him. 
Are we having like the Holy Spirit come down over here? What's going on? Wasps. Okay. Okay. All right. Jesus knew what it was like to have disobedient children. All right. Because we're disobedient children. If you think your two and three year old fussing with each other is bad, think about the adults that fuss with each other that are supposed to be God's children. Think about how many times God has cleaned up after you and did not let you fall into the mess. How many times has he fed you? How many times has he heard you cry? Keep this in mind. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Right? Jesus never sleeps. He never takes a break from caring for you. He never goes on vacation. He's constantly caring for you and the myriads of other children he has, and he does not grumble and he does not complain. Now, I'm not trying to make light of your work, mothers. Really not, because it's the greatest work there is. But you were created to give yourselves away. You were created to give yourselves away. It is the dying to yourself that God created you for, called you to, and saved you for. God created you, he called you, and he saved you so you could die. So that you might live. Jesus said this in John 12, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. We think of motherhood as the process of giving life, and obviously it is. But motherhood is also the act of dying. It's being a grain of wheat and dying so you can bear much fruit. The childbirth process involves death. Ask any doctor. It's why they're so concerned about all the risks. It's painful. It has lasting impacts on the body. You bear in your body, mothers, the signs of death so that others can live. That's pretty amazing to think about, actually. Because when you became a mother, you get to display what Jesus did. He died so others can live. And when you became a mother, you began with giving your life away. You were created to die daily so that others may live. You must die to yourself, not only so your children may live, but also that you may live. Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The Apostle Paul puts this especially for women in 1 Timothy 2 when he says, But women will be saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-respect. Right, having children takes self-dying faith and self-dying love. Being a mother then is a picture of the gospel. And when you have faith for it, that's why he says childbirth saves you. It's not really that like childbirth is what gives you the salvation, but it is a, uh, it's where you exercise your faith, women. Now, the devil wants you to despise self-denial. And he, and he does this, he tempts you to bitterness. I mean, this is why the culture is in love with birth control. The godless are afraid to die, and they do not want to give their lives so others may live. Birth control, abortion, Feminism, it's all just fear, fearfulness and self-preservation, even if it means someone else has to die for them. That's what abortion is. It's calling someone else to die for you. And this is why our culture despises motherhood. <clears throat> it tries to make you think that doing the dishes, doing laundry for the 100th time this week, fixing meals, teaching reluctant children how to do math, cleaning up after the tornado that is your two-year-old. It tries to teach you that these are mundane tasks that are best, are necessary evils to be done mindlessly, joylessly, and at worst, these are things designed to keep you trapped by the patriarchy. The world says to be free, you do really important things, you've got to get away from all that. You get away and you can go do other things that give you immediate satisfaction, gratification. 
whatever you do, don't die. Live. Live to yourself. But in reality, all these mundane tasks, they're not to enslave you. They're opportunities for you to die to yourself and produce life. These are divine occasions from the Lord for you to be saved. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Motherhood carried out in faith, love, holiness, and selflessness is the way of life for women. You show your commitment to Christ through this kind of self-denial. And mothers, when you face the suffering of motherhood, dealing with children and weariness and the desire to give up, God's given you the opportunity to display your faith, your love. He's given you an opportunity for holiness. You have a chance to die to yourself, produce life, and to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Let's think about this in the context of Sunday morning, right? You come to church, you got your two-year-old, your four-year-old, and throughout the whole service, you are like just wrestling, I said, bears. You continually discipline them, but they still whispered, they still fidgeted, they still wiggled around, they dropped their sippy cup eight times. It sounded like a drum because we're on top of a drum. And you felt as if everyone was looking at you and judging you. And you didn't even get to hear a word of the sermon. Felt like a complete waste of time, right? But was it? Was that a waste of time? Or did you get to die to yourself today? Did you get to exercise faith that it was worth it to bring your children to church? Did you get to love your son by correcting him and growing in holiness by exercising your restraint? Did you have to rebuke your own ungodly frustration and bear that in patience? Did you learn humility by having everyone look at you? Did you get to help an elder or another Titus two women get to do their job by encouraging you or strengthening you or criticizing you? Here's the question. Did you get to die to yourself today? If so, not a waste. But rather actually a divine opportunity for you. This is only a, ra a waste if you grow bitter and resentful and refuse to repent of it. It was only a waste if you didn't use the opportunities God gave you. Mom, you're called to self-denial, and Dad, you are too. <laughs> Don't focus on yourself. Rest in Jesus Christ. It's only by abiding in Jesus you will produce lasting fruit. That takes faith, and it takes faith for all of life. Now, you can fight sanctification. You can resent the opportunities for growth. You can spend your life growing hard and calloused. You can be angry with the words that I'm speaking. You can leave the church. You can leave your husband. You can walk away from it all. i tell you the one thing you will not do will be happy. Our world is full of a lot of women that thought they were happy by chasing everything out there and leaving everything. And let me tell you, well, let me just tell it in this way. How many feminisms, feminists does it take to change a light bulb? That's not funny. Okay? What I mean is they're not happy. If you do all that, you'll be walking away of life in the middle of gardening season. You'll also be walking away from the very source of life, Jesus Christ. He died so that you might live. live. And if you refuse to die to yourself and instead choose to live for you... You will produce nothing but death. Again, our culture is full to the brim with miserable women refusing to die to themselves. And they're killing everything around them. All those who hate God love death, Scripture says. Scripture says the only way to life is through Jesus Christ. Psalm 3 reminds us that the tree bears fruit in its season, sorry, not Psalm 3, Psalm 1, verse 3, bears fruit in its season, meaning time passes between planting and harvest, and you have to have faith for the harvest. Think long-term rather than just looking at your immediate situation. Think about what your daily faithfulness and the thick of it all is going to produce. By faith in Christ, you will bear good fruit in its season. In Leviticus 19, God's people had to wait five years tending to the trees before they could finally enjoy the fruit of their labor. Again, we live in an age where we want immediate fruit with the least possible effort. 
And so when we encounter difficulties and trials, we take them as a sign to give up instead as a sign to press on. In our worldly thinking, the difficult becomes the impossible. Again, let me put this in the context of bringing in the, the church, but there's all kinds of other contexts, right? Again, it feels like Sunday's a nightmare. You can't possibly get anything out of the service. By the time your church is over, your blood is boiling. You don't know what to do. You're in the heat of the battle without much end in sight. Well, let's, let's get a picture of what we're actually seeing here, okay? What's happening here? Your children, by bringing them here, are being taught that you and your family go to church on Sunday. They're being taught that it is right and normal to go to church, to sing songs, to hear Bible reading and sermons, and to spend time focused on something much bigger than the distractions of the world. They're being taught to receive godly instruction and correction from other godly people. You know, your children did not learn how to speak right away, right? Did anybody come out of the womb learning how to speak? But let me tell you, from day one, they have been learning how to speak. Probably even before they came out of the womb when they were listening to mom and dad's voice. Right? And you would think, well, no, they can't get anything out of that. They don't know anything. Mm, they're getting quite a bit out of it. Your children are growing up thinking, this is what everyone should do. Let me ask you, when you grew up, was there things in your family that you thought everybody did? Right? You just thought this is the normal thing that everybody did? And then you heard some other family didn't do those things, and you were like, those people are really weird. They didn't do that. And then you found out this other family, they didn't do that. And then you, this, and then you start to realize, wait a second, are we the weird ones? <laughs> like, we're the, we're the ones? Now listen, you're not teaching your children to be weird. You're actually teaching them what should be normal. You're teaching the children that sometimes in life they have to have restraint. And that's a pain stinking effort. And the fruit doesn't come naturally to the children or to the parents for that matter. And it seems like they will never get it. But then it starts to click. It's a long process of planting seeds, watering, and harvest. I remember when Ben Carmack first came to our church and we were in a basement and he had to take those two girls out every single Sunday, multiple times. And I'm looking at it here, and they're sitting there. Now, they're not completely paying attention as they need to, but they're making progress. And I'm sure they've learned quite a bit, haven't they, Ben? There are times when our children have said stuff that I'm like, how did you know about that? Well, I heard that at church. Oh, when? You weren't even, when were you even paying attention? Have faith for the future when your children will be able to focus and learn things that many others cannot. Have faith that it even feels as though your children are not growing, there are. Some of you who have children now who might have, again, thought they can never be controlled and now they're a delight to be around. You have to trust that God is building foundations for the future, even when you feel that you're doing this a complete waste of time. It takes faith that God will use weeks, weeks, or years of frustrating Sundays to bear fruit in your children's life. Mothers, again, you have to have faith for this work. It's such a short season of life that you'll be wrestling with newborns and toddlers, then they're grown, then they're teenagers, and you're wrestling with teenagers. And that's a short season, but it feels like probably forever. I don't know. I'm not there yet, but I've heard from the good sources that it is. But know this, spring and summer don't last very long. Then fall comes, and man, it is beautiful, right? It's harvest time. I look back at my life, and I think about my mom and how she served the church and how she served our family, and she did a lot of things she probably didn't want to do. I think about how my dad served the church. I called it trivocational. I was at a conference saying that this week. Trivocational means like three Usually it means getting paid from three places. He was getting paid in two, and none of them were the church. Most of it was serving the church without pay. And my mom was right there with him. Like, if my dad had to be at church, my mom was there. My dad was the, not only was the associate pastor, he was 
a custodian. And he also was a custodian at his other job that he worked, just to make ends meet. And we would be dragged everywhere. And on Sundays, we were up at the crack of dawn. We would go to church for Sunday school, which is way before we would start here. So you guys haven't made for a while. My mom would work in the nursery while the rest of us were in Sunday school. Then after the worship service, well, actually, during the worship service, my parents were in a choir, so it was a little bit different. And they would sing while my brothers and I would sit in the pews by ourselves. Actually, one time we did this Christmas cantata at a church. It was at my aunt's church. And it is, I'm going to brag, this is because of how good I was. I sat there great, and my brothers were like crawling underneath the pews. And the second that that cantata was over, because my dad was playing the piano, the very second it was over. I mean, the last sound was probably still going. He got up and took those boys downstairs. And it had the reverse problem of here, I think, where we hear everything here down there. You could hear everything down there up, and you could just hear the discipline that was occurring. And I got to sit there like uh, the one time I was good in church. After church, we would go to my grandmother's for lunch, or my mom would have a nice lunch prepared. But before the food could digest, we were back to church for kids' choir practice. Forgive me, puppet practice after that. Sunday evening church. I mean, it was up at crack of dawn, finish and be home in bed at 11 o'clock. And when my dad's job became full-time, now add 45 minutes, a 50 minute drive, both ways. So we would often be at church from early morning until night without going home. And then on Wednesdays, we would be at church for kids programs such as Awana. After that, my parents had church choir practice. And when I was a kid, that seemed to last for days. And I can only imagine how many times we were disciplined for being too rowdy while they were trying to practice. Those were just the weekly commitments, not on top of the other activities, small groups. And there were plenty of opportunities for my parents to give up, resent the church, be discontented. They dealt with people that criticized them. They dealt with all kinds of stuff. Praise God, my mom and dad never gave up. And there had to have been times when it didn't seem that there would be much fruit And yet, all that wiggleness, me sitting in the church fighting wiggles, drawing on the bulletin, I'm, and I drove some great pictures. So much scripture was being put into my mind. Knowledge coming from constantly hearing the preaching of the word. And even then, the fruit was in doubt because in my tw- late teens and 20s, I was a heathen. I ran from the Lord. If you think wrestling a toddler in church worship service is painful, how much more is tears and sleepless nights and prayer over a wayward son who would stay out all late at night and come home sometimes drunk? Praise God, my mother never stopped laboring. She never gave up. They would send me texts every Sunday to tell me about being in church, and I resented them. Praise God, they still send them to me now. My mom didn't give up. That harvest took a long time, and it's not even complete. But I'm the fruit of that labor. My family's the fruit of that labor. This church is the fruit of that labor. And any work that God has allowed me to do in any of your lives is the fruit of that labor. The labor of a mother wrestling a kid in church, missing out on sermons, giving herself to her children and her husband, dying. A mother dying. You must have faith to keep sowing the seed, to keep trimming the weeds, to keep up the daily fight. You must not grow discontented. You must not grumble and complain. Philippians 2, do all things without grumbling or complaining that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in this world. Help each other with this. Don't let your conversations, women, become gripe sessions in which you complain about your husbands or you complain about the other women of the church or you complain about your children. 
Encourage each other with Scripture. Remember James 5, 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. God hates grumbling. He hates how it distracts you from his, your work. He hates how it takes others from their work. He hates how it stirs up division in his people. He hates how it hardens your heart. And he hates how it diminishes his glory. Give thanks in all circumstances. Like when the baby messes his diaper, just as you're about to head out the door to church. Or when you clean something up and the kid makes it a mess again. When you've worn out and your husband tells you, oh, by the way, we're having so-and-so for supper this evening. Oh, great, thanks. Now you tell me. Don't do that, men. But if you do do it, be thankful. When you're exhausted in the middle of the night, give thanks in all circumstances. Listen, there is a day coming. When the only children in your home will be the pictures on the wall. There's a day coming when you will wave goodbye to your children and their children as they load up in the van to go back home from visiting the grandparents. And on that day, your husband will say, My many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. And your children will rise up and bless you. Amen. Even more, there's a day coming when you will stand before God and give an account of your life. Better than hearing your husband say, well done. How about your Savior? Well done, my good and faithful Savior. Mothers, there's always a time between sowing and a time of harvest, so don't give up. Plant yourself in the Word of God. Cling to Jesus Christ. Then you will be like a tree firmly planted by the waters that produces its fruit in its season. So mothers, let me, let me end with this encouragement. This is an, a, a, an encouragement. You are not just mothers. Uh, and, and well, actually, all you women are mothers in some way. Whether you have your own children or other, you're mothers in the church. And you are the queens of this church. You're the daughters of God, and your work as mother is chief among the work of this church. Even pagans recognize some degree the importance of motherhood. Right? There has hardly been any great man in the world who did not owe much, if not most, of the formation of his character to his mother's influence. One author said, the greatest moral power in the world is that which a mother exercises over her young child. You've all heard, she who rocks the cradle rules the world. The work that you mothers do cannot be overemphasized. Your work as mother will set the health, set the health of your whole family. The work of you women in this church will set the health of this church. Your work as mother will set the path for your children. And your work as mother will impact our society. In a great little book called Female Piety, John Engel James said, Napoleon once asked Madame Kaplan what the French, na French nation most needed in order that her youth might be properly educated. And her reply was compressed in one word, mothers. It was a wise reply. And so not only the French nation, the world needs them. Christian, intelligent, well-trained, devoted women to whom the destinies of the rising generation may be safely entrusted. The woman as whose domestic hearth and by whose judicious maternal love, a family of industrious and godly sons or of modest, kind-hearted, prudent, and pious daughters is trained for future life is an ornament of her country a benefactress to her species, and a blessing to posterity. Mothers, the work you do is not just dealing with physical needs like diapers, meals, and dirty houses. Your responsibility over souls, and it's weighty. I know you feel the weight of it, but weightiness is actually a way of describing glory. In other words, motherhood is glorious. What you're doing is very beautiful. It's glorious. And when it's carried out in faith, that's when it's glorious, right? 
when you by faith in Christ give yourself to the work day in, day out, when you trust God for that work, there is nothing more glorious, more beautiful, and more fruitful than motherhood. And all the men say, Mothers, I want you to know how treasured you are in this church. Your sacrifices are not lost on us. And men, if that is true, do all you can as a father and a husband to encourage our queens and God's daughters in this work. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for mothers. Thank you for the women of this church that serve their families, that serve this church in many thankless ways. They may not be on the stage, but Lord, without them, where would we be? Thank you for women. Thank you for little girls and daughters. Thank you for sons. Thank you for fathers, husbands. Thank you for your kindness to give us family and to give us these jobs. And thank you that you call us to die so that there can be much life, much fruit, Give us faith for that fruit and to not give up, especially we're in the middle of the summer and the harvest is to come. And I pray now you would bless us by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen.